In this lecture, we will be looking at Chapter 2, Ancient Mesopotamia and Persia. Um, I know there is a lot of information in this chapter, and just remember the point of these lectures. You, I recommend that you read the chapter first and then listen to the lectures, because what I'm going to do in the lectures is I will focus in on some key aspects and give um, a little bit more information on some elements. The lecture is not meant to be a substitute for the reading. Also, as you're looking at this chapter, pay attention to how he organizes the chapters, and that'll help you organize you know, your thoughts. And so what happens in this chapter is this chapter is organized by looking at different geographical areas. So pay attention to where you physically are, and again, that will help you uh, hopefully remember some of the artwork. So link the artwork with the area that it is in. So what we are going to look at in this chapter is, again, by the title, Ancient Mesopotamia and Persia. So we are going to start in Mesopotamia. Now, as we read last time, uh, when we left off, humans were going from hunter and gatherers to becoming farmers and herders. And this is what is called the Neolithic Revolution. So we left off after chapter one with, <clears throat> excuse me, with humans beginning to cultivate the land and beginning to domesticate animals. And that radically changed how human life was. And in fact, what we have now is we're gonna start having the first civilizations. Now this change first occurred in an area which is known as Mesopotamia. Uh, Mesopotamia, it's a Greek name for land between the rivers. And the rivers that this area is between are the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. And this is also known as what's called the Fertile Crescent. The area you can see on the map here is a huge arc that is located along the borders of current Turkey and Syria and through Iraq to Iran's uh, Zagros Mountains. The area is believed to also be the location of the biblical Garden of Eden, and in fact, all three major monotheistic religions began here, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So we are first going to begin, we are in Mesopotamia, but then we are going to look at the city-state of Sumer. This roughly is in southern Iraq today, and what we have during this time period is how places organized is what's called a city-state. And so what we see in these city-states is they became more complex urban societies. And what we have in Sumer is actually a civilization of over a dozen different city-states. This, this idea of the city-state, this complex urban society, is an invention that transformed the ancient world. Sumerian rulers were considered the gods' representation on earth, and they were the stewards of their earth and treasures. Sumerians also developed agriculture so well that only a portion of the population had to produce food, meaning they were making enough food so that everyone didn't have to be a farmer. So because of that, others could specialize in different areas. And so we're going to see a growth in manufacturing, trades, and administration all develop within the city-state. So things that had once been the responsibility of the individual, think you're responsible for your own food, your own protection, the supplies you needed in your own home, this could now be obtained through others. Also, and probably one of the most important inventions during this time, is the invention of writing. The oldest known written documents are Sumerian records of administration, administrative acts and commercial transitions. Again, this is that notion that the gods reside above the world of humans and that they would come down. And this idea is actually also central to most of the world's religions. Uh, the tallest known temple was at Babylon, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail later, and it was actually 270 feet high. Uh, the Hebrews called it the Tower of Babel, and it became the centerpiece of a biblical story about the arrogant and disrespectful pride of humans. Also, we have what are known as Mesopotamian seals. And these were generally made of stone, but they could be made of other materials such as ivory, glass, um, and other found materials. And you have 
two different types. You had a flat stamp seal, and literally think of it like kind of almost like a rubber stamp today, or the round cylinder seals. Uh, the cylinder seals actually quickly replaced the flat stamp seals because you could roll them over the clay and cover a greater area more quickly. And here you see an example of this the, on the figure 2.8. On the left is the cylinder seal, and then on the right is actually the impression made from the seal. So the Sumerians and other ancient Mesopotamian peoples use both the stamp and cylinder seals to authenticate documents and to protect storage jars and doors against tampering. We actually still see this influence today. Think when someone is sealing an envelope with wax and a seal, right? That's the same idea and also different official stamps and seals are based off of this idea. Now these seals actually give historians a bunch of priceless information. Uh, it tells us about their religion, the society, including how they dress, how they dined, what the shrines looked like, how they depicted gods, the rulers, and other mythological figures because all this could be depicted in the seal. And what we're seeing here, this is actually the cylinder seal, cylinder seal of uh, Puabi, who was a, sometimes they call her a queen. They actually don't have any information that she was a queen, but she was definitely a wealthy woman from Ur. And again, what you see on the left, that is the seal. And then on the right, that's from taking the seal and rolling it over the clay. And you see the relief that is made from the seal. So this again would literally be her mark. Also next we have what's called the standard of Ur. And what this is, the name itself can be a little misleading because it's the idea that it, it's related to the military. Um, we don't know that for certain, but what's very interested, interesting in this is the information again that it gives us. So this is actually a small wooden box and it's inlaid with stones, uh, both the lapis lazuli and red limestone and shells. Uh, it has a broad, two broad rectangular faces on either end and then a narrow trapezoid end. So in this side, you can see one of the very broad rectangular bases and that trapezoidal side. Now what's interesting on this is the two different sides, the flat side, I'm sorry, the flat sides, the rectangular sides gives us a lot of information. And so they're commonly known as the war side and the peace side. We are currently looking at the war side. Again, its dates are circa 2550 to 2400 BCE. Now what we're seeing here is this is actually read from the bottom up. And the idea of that was probably so the most important figure is near the top center. So what we're looking here on the bottom side, I'm sorry, the war side, the bottom row, there are four chariots, each with a driver and a soldier or a warrior. Now it's been debated if this is actually supposed to be four different chariots or if it's supposed to show the same chariot in different moments of motion. Um, you can see there are bodies of the enemies literally below them and they are, uh, blood is coming out of their wounds. Now in the middle row, these are the foot soldiers and the foot soldiers are leading captives of war. And then the top row, this is the soldiers bringing the bound captives to the ruling figure. Now the ruling figure, we can clearly see him in this. He is in the top middle. He is much bigger than anybody else in the work. And in fact, if you look at the little border that frames it, his head actually breaks the top border. So again, what's happening in this one are the captives being taken to the leader. Now the other side is what's known as the peace side. And this shows a banquet that is happening. So perhaps after the war, a celebration. On the bottom row, there are men carrying goods on their backs. The middle row, there are attendants bringing fish and other animals to the banquet. And then the top row, we see the ruler and his guests attending the banquet. Again, the ruler is bigger than everyone else. If you look on that top row, he is the third figure from the, our left. He again is bigger and he breaks once again that border. 
On the far right, what's also interesting is there are two entertainers. There's a musician who plays a harp, much like um, the harp that is mentioned in your textbook a little bit earlier in the reading. And then there's also a singer. Now, some scholars believe this might be showing actual events, but other scholars think it's actually showing the role of the Sumerian leader. Uh, the ruler was supposed to be both the mighty warrior who defeats the enemies and the chief administrator who maintains the balance of the city-state. Another example of Sumerians' record keeping of events are what's called steel. Um, and your textbook talks about the steel of, vert, of the virtues. Um, I don't have it pictured here. You can see it in your book. But what it is, a steel is a carved stone slab erected to commemorate specific uh, uh, events. The one in the text is celebrating a victory over a, a war victory, a battle over a neighboring city state. And so this literally gave us the information. But also what's interesting about these steels is it was one way to commemorate these events as a public monument. And this idea of commemorating the events as a public monument is also an invention of the Sumerians. All right, now we are going to move to another location, and this is where we're going to look at uh, the Okat. So we don't actually know the location of the city, but it is believed to be near Babylon. Uh, the Akkadians were Semitic in origin, meaning they were Mesopotamian people who spoke a language that was related to Hebrew and Arabic. However, what's interesting is they did not use their own language in their writing. They used the uh, Sumerians' cuneiform in their, in their written documents. The city-state was run by an all-powerful king, and unlike we saw in, Sumer in Sumeria, allegiance was to him and not to the state. And so the great ruler was uh, Sargon, and this actually means true king. His grandson, Naram-Sin, called himself the king of the four quarters, meaning ruler of the earth, much like a god. So in this area, they saw the rulers as almost these godlike figures, where in Samaria, we were talking about more of, you know, paying uh, respect to the gods. And what we are looking at here, this is a sculpture, and then it's actually a, the head of an Akkadian ruler. And this is circa 20. Uh, 2250 to 2200 BCE and this is only the head of it um, it had been it was an entire sculpture parts of it had been destroyed but what's so interesting of this is that again it shows this idea of absolute monarchy that the ruler is the head of everything however we actually clearly see it was destroyed when they were defeated, but it also shows very deliberate mutilation of the sculpture. Uh, the eyes were gouged out, part of the lower beard was broken off, and the ears were slashed. And so this is an example of showing discontent with the ruler by destroying the statue of it. I mean, think about, you know, within when Saddam Hussein's reign was ended. One of the first things they did was tear down the sculptures and statues of him. And so this is that same idea. Also, this shows us the skills of the, of the sculptor at the time. We see this balance of naturalism and the abstract. Uh, it's not an exact repli replication or portrait of the ruler. However, you do see the distinctive features of the ruler in the work, such as the nose, the long curly beard, the textures of the hair and the skin, and the patterns in the hair. So all of this, if we would know, if we were, you know, lived at the time, we would know who this was a representation of. Also, what's interesting, this is the oldest known life-size hollow cast metal sculpture that is known. Uh, hollow casting, I'm not going to go to all of it right now. It is one of the four methods of execution in sculpture. And it is casting is, and it is a very difficult technique that requires both time and skill. And so this is the oldest known life-size hollow cast uh, metal sculpture that no has been known to exist. All right, moving on, we're going to look at the Neo-Sumerian Age, or what's also called uh, the Third Dynasty of Ur. Now, in 2150 BCE, the Gushans ended the Akkadian rule. 
the cities of Sumer uh, united and drove the Gushans out. And then this established what's called the Neo-Sumerian Neo state, Neo meaning new. So this is the new Sumerian state, and this again was ruled by a king. So we know it as the Neo-Sumerian -Sumer Age or the Third Dynasty of Ur. Again, here we have the type of temple. We have the ziggurat. A ziggurat is a rectangular stepped tower, often leading to a temple on the top. This one was more than 50 feet high, and it was began by the founder of the third dynasty, ur Imam, and was finished by his son and successor, uh, Shulji. It is the oldest preserved tier temple platform, and it was made of baked bricks laid in bitnium, which is almost like an asphalt-like substance. On the right, we see the Gura of Lagos, which was the ruler of the third dynasty. Um, here what we're going to see is they return to the idea that the ruler was the agent of the gods in service to his people. Um, there were over a dozen statues placed in temples to show him doing his duty. Many of them have inscriptions with messages to the gods of Sumer. And often these were made of polished uh, diorite, which was a rare and expensive stone that had to be imported from what's known as present-day uh, Oman. It was extremely hard and difficult to work with. However, it lent prestige to the portraits and therefore to the ruler. Then we're going to move on to Babylon. Um, the third dynasty was actually short-lived. It fell to the Elamites. And what happens is we're going to see the political system of city-states re-emerge. And Babylon is one of these city-states. The most powerful king was Hammurabi. Uh, his rule was 1792 to 1750 BCE, and he's most well known today for his nearly 300 codified laws. And these laws covered everything from murder, adultery, to cutting down your neighbor's tree. Um, they were preserved in the steel that you see here, and here it shows Hammurabi with the sun god, and then we have over 3,500 lines of cuneiform characters that list the laws and their punishments. And you can see the reading in your textbooks for some ex uh, exact examples of that. Well, what eventually is going to happen is the Babylonian Empire is going to fall to the Hittites. Um, it was sacked in 1595 BCE, and then they abandoned Mesopotamia. Uh, Babylon was then left to the Kassites, and then to the east of Babylon was Elam, which is present-day Iran. Um, here we're going to see different works of painted pottery and different great bronze statues. But then we're going to move to Assyria or the Assyrian Empire. And so what happened is they actually wiped out the Elamites who had taken over Babylon. Um, their name, the Assyrian name, actually comes from Assur, which is the city east of the Tigris River in the Zagros Mountains, which is in modern-day northern Iraq. Uh, this was dedicated to the god Ashur, or Asher. Um, at the height of their power, their empire extended from the Tigris River to the Nile and from the Persian Gulf to Asia Minor, which you can see on the map here. They were pretty merciless to anyone who dared to oppose them, but they were merciful to those who submitted. So if you challenged their rule, they pretty much wiped you out. But if you agreed to their rule, they would um, basically absorb you into the empire. Their palaces were built as fortified citadels. Uh, they were often guarded by large, monstrous figures. Uh, the walls were decorated with mural paintings and relief sculptures. Now, the empire itself, though, was never actually very secure. Uh, the rulers often had to fight uh, revolts throughout Mesopotamia, and eventually the Assyrian Empire is going to crumble from both interior problems and attacks from the outside. So then we're going to move on to New Babylonia. Uh, the most renowned king here was Nebuchadnezzar II, his reign was 605 to 562 BCE, and his exploits are actually told in the Bible's book of Daniel. 
Now, he restored Babylon as one of the great cities of antiquity. In fact, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon are still considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, the Tower of Babel was the city's enormous ziggurat, and they considered their city the center of the world. And the ziggurat was seen as the Axis Mundi, meaning it was the symbolic pole con con um, connecting the earth to the heavens. So it was the symbolic pole connecting the earth to the heavens. And what we're looking at here, this is actually the Ishtar Gate. This is a 47 foot high gate made of blue glazed bricks. Um, you can see it has a large arch shaped opening. And the bricks, many of them have reliefs of animals on them. And these animals were both real and imaginary. And then each brick was made individually and then set in the proper sequence on the wall. All right, then we're gonna move to Persia. Um, here we have Cyrus of Persia, whose reign was 559 to 529. And he sacked Babylon in 539 BCE and he became known as the founder of the Achaemenid Empire. Um, Egypt fell to this empire in 525 BCE. By 480 BCE, they had the largest empire the world had ever known. They were known for luxurious cups and plates of gold and silver, and you can read about more of that in detail in your textbook. The line does end with the death of Darius III in 330 BCE after his defeat by Alexander the Great. And so what we're going to look at here is what's called the Persepolis. And this area contains one of the most important sources of knowledge about Persian art and architecture. Um, it was the ceremonial and administrative complex within the citadel at Persepolis. It was built between 521 and 465 BCE. It sat on a high plateau and it was a heavily fortified complex of royal buildings. The approach to the citadel was through a monumental gateway called the Gate of All Lands. And this was a reference to the harmony among the different peoples of the Persian Empire. Um, we're going to see man-headed winged bulls that flack the entrance. And we had, there's a broad ceremonial stairway that led to a platform in a royal hall. And over 10,000 guests could stand in it at one time. It was made of mud brick walls and had paved stone or brick floors. Now the chief feature is what you're going to see uh, in this, the images here. And this was basically what they considered a forest of 36 columns. They consisted of tall bases with a ring of palm leaves. And the shafts of each column were 57 feet high with flutes that were topped with enormous capitals topped by polished and painted back-to-back um, uh, -back animal protomes which you can see on the bottom right here. What the protome is, it's the head, four legs, and part of the body of an animal. So with the capitals and the animal protomes, which were seven feet tall, making each column over 65 feet tall. And so you're going through, right, this kind of forest of 36 dif uh, different uh, columns made to be very awe-inspiring. Uh, the walls themselves were decorated with reliefs showing a procession of royal guards, Persian nobles, dignitaries, and representatives from 23 different nations. Each one can be told apart because of their distinctive uh, features and dress. We do find traces of paint, um, so it lets us know that they were probably very brightly colored. Uh, the forms of people are more rounded and more lifelike. But we can see clear Greek influence in the drapery of the fabric. And so this testifies to the active exchange of ideas um, um, and, uh, and artists among all the civilizations of Persia, Mesopotamia, and the Mediterranean at the time, because we find these common features. Alexander the Great actually raised the city in 330 BCE as a symbol of the destruction of the Persian imperial power. And then this led to a long period of Greek and then Roman rule of large parts of Mesopotamia. 
In the third century CE, new power rose in Persia with the goal of pushing the Romans out of Asia. And then we're going to conclude the chapter by looking at the Sasanian Empire. Now they trace their lineage to a direct descendant of the Achaemenid kings, Sasun. Um, we have Ardishir, who was the first Caesarian king, his rule 211 to 241 BCE, and he founded there what they called the New Persian Empire in 224. Here we have the great palace at Tessiphon, and that's what you see pictured here. And this is near modern Baghdad, uh, Iraq. It is still seen as the standard for judging architecture in the area. Now, the new Persian Empire lasted more than 400 years, but eventually the Arabs drove the Caesarians out of Mesopotamia in 636 CE, four years after the death of Muhammad. And so after this chapter and the next chapter, we're going to move on to Egypt.